Kaczynski and Dr. Matthew Wade, who will be talking about dry eyes, eye drops and procedures to treat your dry eyes. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat or you can save them until the end of the lecture when the doctors will field your questions. Thanks again for joining us. Enjoy the lecture. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Matthew Wade. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for being here. This is, uh, this is fun for us to have a chance to, to chat. And um, just to me, it kind of feels like we're all gonna be in the office here and we can just talk about what, it, what, what dry eyes look like, what they feel like, and what, uh, what an exam looks like for dry eye disease. So, you know, my, all of our eyes get irritated. You know, we have a lot of irritations in Southern California, but eye irritation is definitely one of them. And I have a ton of patients who come in and they, they rarely say I have dry eyes. They say things like I have tired eyes or my eyes are red or my eyes are irritated or my, my vision fluctuates up and down. And yet all of these things really point to dry eye disease. So point number one really for me is dry eye disease is multifactorial. And there are a lot of inputs. There are a lot of things that cause it. There are a lot of treatments that we'll talk about. But rarely do people come in and say, my eyes feel dry, I have dry eye disease. So we'll talk more about that. Point number two is it's incredibly common. If you were to uh, join me in the, in the room and just be a fly on the wall and see patients with me, almost every single patient I see has some element of dry eye disease. And I'm wager so do all of you. I mean, probably not too big of a guess you guys are here on a Tuesday night for um, a dry eye disease lecture. Have a sec. And, uh, Thank you. And I have dry eye disease as well. So let's jump into this and let me start sharing my screen here. Okay, perfect. Okay, there we go. So so like I said, people come in, they feel like their eyes are scratchy. They feel as if something is in the eye, that they're having pain or redness, discharge, heaviness in the eyelids, light sensitivity, eye fatigue, blurred vision, you name it. The symptoms really are pretty widespread. And so when we look at these, you know, and by the way, feel free to share symptoms you have that may be different than this in terms of what your dry eye disease looks like or feels like to you. So what are we really talking about when we talk about dry eye disease? I mean, really, the eye, the eye is not dry. The whole eye is full with fluid. But we're not talking about inside the eye. We're talking about the surface of the eye. And if you think about the ocular surface, which is really a better way, a better term to think about than dry eye disease, uh, it's really everything you can see on, on an image from a camera. So right here, we see a beautiful eye. We see the clear window in front of a colored part of the eye that's called the cornea. The white part of the eye with little vessels is actually two layers. There's the conjunctiva, and then underneath is the white sclera, the structural component of the eye. And all of this is part of the ocular surface. But wait, there's actually more, because if you look up, down, left, or right, you'll see other corners of the eye that you don't see in the normal photograph. Here you can see the underside of the eyelid, and that's part of the ocular surface as well. And of course, we can see these different areas. So what we don't see, even with these pictures, is something else called the tear film. And the tear film is basically the clear coat of tears and the components that make them up that washes over the eye on a consistent basis when we blink. So the anatomy of the tear film. So there's, there's a lipid layer, which is the front layer. There's aqueous, which is the, the lipid is the fat, it's oil. It's a very thin layer on the top. The aqueous is uh, fluid, basically that what we think about from our tears. And then the mucin is actually mucus. These three components constitute the tear film. And the health of the tear film is really important in ocular surface disease. So where do these, where do these components come from? Well, the tear gland, there's a tear gland that produces the aqueous, the watery part of the tears. There are oil glands. If you, if you Imagine your eyelids coming together. Along the bottom and the top, there are rows of oil glands that secrete a little bit of oil that coat the surface of the tears. And they actually keep the tears from evaporating too quickly. So they're really helpful. And then we have glands that produce the mucus that we talked about. So here is a great picture. We've used a little bit of a stain, fluorescein stain, and it shows up as this yellow green. And you can see a, a little strip of that yellow green along the bottom here. And that's 
that's showing us a tear lake or that gravity is pulling down the, the tears that are on the ocular surface, that tear film is coalescing on the, on the lower eyelid and sitting there. And you can imagine when you blink, and this is a great analogy that Dr. Lee came up with, when you blink, it's like your upper eyelids are just catching that tear film and pulling it across the ocular surface and refreshing and replenishing that surface every time. So we're gonna watch a little video here that shows that. You can see the tear lake there, a blink just pulls that, that fluid across the surface. And you can see that it's dynamic. It gets higher and lower. And this, this lake of tears also drains out through the punctum to the back of your, to your nose. So if you watch a sad movie, if you watch you know, a sad movie and you start crying, your nose starts running because the tears uh, go out that direction. Here's another picture though of someone who has a lower tear lake. You can imagine when the, when the blink happens, there's not quite as much of that tear film to pull across that front surface. There's not quite as much replenishment or rejuvenation with this situation. So let's, when we add that fluorescein dye and we look at the tear film, we can actually see that here, you see that the green all the way across. So that means the tear film is intact. We like to see this, but in many instances in dry eye, that tear film starts breaking up and you can see these dark areas on the right here where the tear film has broken up. So we can time that, we can see how long it lasts and that gives us a good indication of how the healthy the tear film is. So if, if the surface is dry, and you're here on the right we have a, a healthy ocular surface, uh, it looks normal, the tear film's good. And on the left, we have this surface that has, it's just pockmarked with all these little spots, these dry eye spots. And this is what happens, this is kind of severe, but this is what happens when, when the tear film isn't doing its job. So when you come to see us, this is part of what we're looking at. We're looking for these things. And as we continue through the examination, other things we see are, you know, redness. We're looking for signs of inflammation in terms of the redness of the eye. We're looking at the eyelids. We're looking for infection or allergy. We're looking for any gaps. Sometimes due to surgery or age or scarring, there's a gap that happens when you blink. And as you can imagine, that's an area where things can really dry out. We can have a lot of evaporation that's happening there when the eyelids don't come together properly. So this is the underside of an eyelid and it's being imaged in a special way. This is called mybography. And we're looking at these oil glands. You can see how long they are. And let's look at the opening. Where they open up uh, is just at the eyelid margin. And, and by the way, when you have a sty, if you've seen someone who has a sty or if you've had one, it's that these glands that get plugged up and the oil builds up and inflammation happens, that's really, that's really associated with this. So you can see these oils don't look super healthy. We'd love to see an oil that looks more like olive oil, but this is looking pretty thick. And this is another little video here. You can see adding some pressure, you can see these oils kind of come out and these ones are coming out like toothpaste. We really wanna see it again, more like olive oil, but this is coming out more solid. Yeah, but definitely plugged up. You can tell that that's plugged up. Okay, so again, these are from Dr. Lee, great analogy here. On the left, we have butter. On the right, we have olive oil. We want to see those oils come out like olive oil. And in many cases, they look more like butter or toothpaste. And why is that a problem? Remember, we talked about the oil coating the tear film surface. So if you break up that butter, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't dissipate very well on the tear film surface. It just kind of sits there. It's kind of chunky, whereas the olive oil really is nice and clean. And, and if you try to look through these, these uh, cups, with the butter or the olive oil sitting on top of that, of that aqueous tear level. I'm just gonna go back just to show you how this is exactly how it's like. There's an oil layer on the top and then there's that flu layer on the bottom. So in any, in any case, you can't see as well through the butter one, right? So we don't want butter, butter for, our, butter for the bread, but not for our eyes. We want something that looks like olive oil. So other tests that we use to measure how the eye is doing, how the ocular surface is doing, are the Schirmer's test. We can see how much tear production that the eye can, uh, can make. We can check for inflammation on the surface of the eye. And we can look again, mybography. We can look at the health or presence or absence of those meibomian glands, the oil glands of the eyelids. On the left, you have normal. And then in Sjogren's syndrome on the right, 
you have some dropout of those glands. We can even do some really high, this is Dr. Lee's uh, uh, confocal microscopy where we're scanning, she's scanning through the different layers of the cornea and you saw nerves and other things. And, and we can see differences in dry eyes versus non-dry eyes. So this is all, these are all really interesting tests that we can use to uh, add to our, our clinical picture here. So another thing we're looking for are little mites. Actually, we can get infections of the hair follicles. And I'm gonna show you some pictures. You see the buildup. If you follow the eyelash back to the eyelid, you see that little buildup and mound there. And I'll show you a zoomed in picture. Here we're seeing these little mites that are infecting right next to the eyelash. And what, is, what does this do? This causes inflammation. Inflammation causes you know, more irritation to the surface. And let's zoom in even further and we can see here this little mite that's there. So Dr. Lee will talk about some things we can do to treat this. I just wanted to highlight what we're looking for here. So we, we do all these tests. We look at all these things. And those are all the things we see on exam. Those are the signs. But we, we don't diagnose dry disease alone with just the signs. We really want to know how you're feeling and how you're doing. The symptoms are equally important. And there are many patients who come in who have symptoms but very little signs or vice versa. We may see a lot of things going on in the eye and they may have very few symptoms. So it really is that both of these things that we take together to diagnose someone with dry eye disease or ocular surface disease. And unfortunately, the roadmap of this really really is progressive over time. It's going to worsen over time. I tell patients it worsens with birthdays and, uh, and it just uh, it doesn't get better unless we treat it. And even if when we're treating it, we're trying to manage it and control it and not, it's not just one treatment and it's gone. So there's some pushback. There's some kind of, this doesn't add up that comes from patients. In fact, just the other day, last week I had a patient and she was tearing and I said, you have dry eyes. And she said, no, I don't have dry eyes. My eyes are tearing all the time. How can I possibly have dry eyes? I, I want my money back. But, but in actuality, it, when our eyes get really dry, we have kind of this reflex tearing that can be turned on. Remember, if you've ever had something stuck in your eye and the tears that come to try to wash that, that uh, foreign body out, that same system can be activated when our eyes are really dry. So sometimes tearing actually is a sign of severe dryness. So again, when we have this ocular surface disease, it really means, or dryness, that means that the whole ocular surface is having some, some type of issue. It could be multifactorial. Again, it could be infection, inflammation, allergy. Uh, all these sorts of things play into ocular surface disease. And really what we're here to do is to try to match things up and say, okay, you're not producing enough tears, let's add more tears. Or you don't have enough healthy oils, let's try to improve your oils. Let's give you omega-3s. Let's, let's undo the blockage of the oil glands that we're seeing. If the eyelids aren't closing, like that other picture I showed you where the eyelids came uh, not all the way together, then we, we try to improve that. Uh, if there's too much evaporation, if there's you know other pathologies, we try to treat those. And uh, Dr. Lee's going to double click on some of these things to, to tell us more about the drops and the treatments that we use and that are top of the Top of the line now for dry eye disease. Hey, great. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me? And I'm going to take over from here. You can see my screen, right? Okay, so we're going to, he uh, introduced the different types of dry eye, the different components of the tear film. And we're gonna go now into a deep dive of what treatment strategies we can use to treat dry eye, okay? So I want to point out that there are so many treatment options right now that there's not one specific treatment that works for everyone. Um, in fact, this is a handout that we have in our office that we give to patients, but don't worry about reading what's on this slide. The point I want to make is that there are so many treatment options. We take this two-sided paper and we check off the specific boxes for each patient. So you come away from your visit with us knowing exactly which treatments we have selected and tailored for your type of dry eye. So you know your neighbors or your best friends 
dry eye is may not be the same as yours. And uh, a lot of people come in saying, oh, I've tried everything. But like, look at how long this list is. And we pretty much try to stick to the common procedures and the common drops when we make these handouts. But what I want to say is that this is not an exhaustive list either. So let's go through some of these things today. So artificial tears and ointments are the mainstay of treatment for dry eye. And there are many, many brands on the market and some brands have many products. And the patients always ask me, what's the best one? Just tell me what's the best one and I'll go buy that one. The problem is there isn't one single best one. It depends on your situation. It depends on what type of dry eye you have. There are drops that are made for people who have very mild dry eye. There are other types that are for patients with more severe dry eye. There are types of drops that won't blur the vision. And then there are drops that will last longer, but may be more blurring because they're thicker. And then there are also ointments that you may want to use when you sleep at night, especially if you sleep with your eyes a little bit open. So I don't mean to say that your eyes are wide open, but some people when they sleep, their eyelids don't come all the way down. There's a little bit of a gap. And in that gap, you evaporate a lot of tears when you sleep at night. So for that problem, we do like to recommend ointments. Um, other patients who do well with ointments are ones who have very severe dry eye during the course of the daytime when their eyes are open and the wind and dust and air is passing by, they're losing a lot of tears. And the nighttime when the eyes are closed and it traps moisture inside is a really great time for the eyes to heal. And so we can um, add to that by doing some ointments. So I purposely not put any brand names here, but I do want to point out that there's a difference between preservative free and these are preservative free and these ones have preservatives. So I'm not talking about which brand or which manufacturer, but if you look at this kind of packaging where they're single individual vials and there are a couple of drops in each vial versus this bottle that can be shelf stable for you know, a year, this one's gonna have some preservatives and this one won't. So if you're using your artificial tears more than a couple of times a day on a regular basis, you want to invest in these, okay? So that you don't add preservatives to an already dry eye. So here's an analogy I like to make for patients. Let's say you wanna take a bath, and I, and I mean a bath in the bathtub, not a shower and you just have so little water in the bathtub that you know, you're not gonna be able to properly take a bath with such little water in there. So here's my daughter. And um, the point I wanna make is if you, don't, if you don't have enough water in your bathtub, you just have to add the water from the outside. So that's what you're doing with the artificial tears. You're just supplementing the tears that your eye isn't making naturally with tears that you buy from the store and add externally. Um, so how often you have to use those drops depends on patient to patient. Now, here's my another analogy. So let's say you wanna take a bath here. Not only do you have not have a lot of tears, not a lot of water in the bathtub, but I put these toys to designate that, you know, that water is dirty. Um, so, you want to try to clean up those tears as well. So if you have in a type of dry eye that is accompanied by inflammation, and not everyone does, but the types of dry eye that are associated with inflammation do well with anti-inflammatory treatment. Now, in the short term, in a very severe um, flare of dry eye, sometimes we'll use steroid drops but those have side effects and we never recommend using those long-term. So for a patient who needs anti-inflammatory medication long-term to control the inflammation that is associated with dry eye, we recommend drops like these. And these are, to my knowledge, the only ones that are FDA approved in the United States currently for the treatment of specifically dry eye. But the, thing patients need to understand about these drops is 
they are not intended for you to feel better the moment you put them in. In fact, it takes at least around a month or two months, sometimes more than that, for the drop to really kick in, for it to really start improving the inflammation. So you really gotta stick with it. And a very common side effect of these medications is they can burn when you put it in your eye. And so that doesn't necessarily mean the drop won't work, but it is um, something I warn almost all patients about. Have you ever heard of serum tears or autologous serum? We generally reserve this for very, very severe forms of dry eye. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, instead of going to your local pharmacy and getting the over-the-counter drops that we've been talking about, that you just go skip that and go to this. It's usually reserved for patients who have already exhausted several other uh, strategies for treating their dry eye. And what we do is we um, have someone come and take your blood someone draw the blood from your, you know, from your arm, and then we spin it down, remove all the blood cells. So it's no longer red, right? So all the blood cells, and including the red blood cells are removed. And that liquid that is left is called serum. And as opposed to the artificial tears you buy in the store, it's basically just water and salt. And maybe a few of the brands add a little bit of oil. Um, this, as opposed to that, the Serum tears are from your own body. So they're, they have biological factors that you cannot buy in a store. So they have growth factors and um, healthy things in the tears, uh, in the bottle that you can't get when you buy something over the counter. And the idea is that for someone with really severe dry eye, that this is uh, an additional way for it to help your eyes heal from those severe dry spots. I'm sure you've heard of using warm compresses. Now, um, the proper way to do the warm compresses is to use a, a clean towel or a washcloth, put it in under, under hot water. Um, sometimes you can put it in cold water and just microwave it very, very briefly. Wring out the extra water and lay it on both eyes with the eyes closed. And you wanna aim for five to 10 minutes, uh, one to two times per day, to start and maybe you know once you're getting better you can do it a little bit less for maintenance but um, it, it, we commonly recommend this why well dr wade already told you about my uh, analogy of you want a good quality olive oil but you've got butter so what can you do to make the butter more like olive oil well if you heat the butter and melt the butter it's not exactly like olive oil, but it's a lot smoother. It's a, a lot more liquidy. It's easier to get that liquid oil to come out of the clogged gland than just trying to squeeze the you know, thick cold butter out of the hole, okay? So uh, we showed some videos earlier of um, at, during the exam, we actually manually squeeze the glands to see what kind of quality oil comes out of the oil gland. Now that's not something you should or could do at home. Um, so the, but the heat is something that you can do and you can buy a product if you like, that's a mask that you heat in the microwave. However you do it, we like, the idea is that you apply the heat to the eyelid to try to melt those clogged up buttery secretions and make them more like olive oil. And I'm sure you've also heard of Eyelid scrubs or lid hygiene is another way we call it. But the idea is that some people have uh, some built up debris, dead skin cells, um, and we want to get that debris off of the eyelashes. Why? Because it can harbor bacteria or it can be a product of the little mites that Dr. Wade showed you. And there are lots of different products now on the market. We used to talk about using baby shampoo and diluting it with water and using a Q-tip like the picture on the upper left here. Um, but actually I find that that's kind of cumbersome for patients and then they forget and they just use the baby shampoo straight onto their eye, which is probably uh, too strong. So there are actually a lot of products now on the market and I, I'm not, I don't own any stock in any of these and I don't um, think one is necessarily better than the other, but 
Uh, there are many on the market and there are different kinds. There are ones that are sprays and you spray it on a cotton pad or a cotton ball and use that. There are ones that are foams and you um, pump it into your hand and you get it on your fingertips and you use your fingertips to wash the eyelashes in the shower or they make wipes. They're all different kinds. And I think that that's probably um, easier to do for most people than diluting the baby shampoo. But the idea is that you wanna wash off all of that debris that is on the eyelash margin because um, we don't want any of that debris to clog the oil glands. So I'll show you, this is a patient who um, wore a lot of eye makeup and you can see that some of the debris from the eye makeup is here and it's covering the openings of where the oil glands are. And so I've already tried to squeeze her oil glands and you can see that this you know, is one of the secretions that came out. But a lot of the other glands were so clogged that even when I tried, I'm using two Q-tips here to try to squeeze the glands, that's the only one where anything came out. So a lot of her glands were really clogged and I tried to advise her, you know, be really careful about where you put your eye makeup. You know, you can put, it's not that you can't wear eye makeup, it's just you need to be careful about washing it off properly. And you know, it's so common that patients say, oh, I wash my makeup off every night. Um, and then I say, well, did you wear makeup this morning? They said, no, I washed it off last night. But because I'm seeing the eye magnified, like this is really what I see every day. I am looking through a microscope. You can't see in your bathroom mirror what I can see. So it's very common that people leave a lot of eye makeup and they, it often covers the glands, um, gland openings and you don't, you're not realizing it. But uh, to be fair, I don't wanna suggest that this is a condition that only occurs in women. It can happen to men too, even if there's no makeup involved. So Dr. Wade also showed you some of those pictures of the, the mites and um, as disgusting as it sounds, their droppings can get collected at the base of the lash. So you can try to wash it off with the products we talked about, but if you're doing your best at home and you can't get this debris off the base of the lash, there is a procedure that we can do to help you with that. So this is called Blefex, and I'll show you uh, a video of me performing it. And so you can see at the base of those lashes, that kind of, um, we call them collarettes, because it's like, here's the eyelash, there's a little collar around it. And it's really hard for this patient to get it off on her own. So this procedure, uh, we apply a special soap that is safe for the eye, and it's on a rotating little um, brush, a disposable brush that a new one for each eye, and it's rotating and creating those soap suds. So it's like you uh, getting a deep cleanse. So we do all four eyelids back and forth, back and forth. And you know, I can see when I'm done that a lot of that material has come off. So what if you can't get the thick, buttery oil out of your oil glands? You know, you're doing the warm compresses at home and, you know, you come back in and you're still having this problem where the tears evaporate off your eye too quickly because there's not a proper layer of oil in front of the water layer to prevent evaporation. Well, you're already doing your best with the warm compresses. Sometimes you need a little extra help because um, maybe you're doing a great job with the warm compresses, but the oil is still stuck inside. So you can come in for a procedure that's called meibomian gland expression. So basically it's a combination of the heat plus mechanical squeezing of the glands to get that stuck butter out of the glands. So we offer this in our office too. There are two different types, but basically they're doing the same thing. They're heating the glands. So either with this sort of a sticker that's uh, connected to this device here that the patient can control. This, this is the device that controls the heat. And you see that the uh, 
connected to all four eyelids and we place the sticker directly on top of the skin through which the meibomian glands would be underneath there. This is one method to heat the glands. The other is with this device here called uh, Lipid Flow. So I'll just show you quickly um, a video of, so after the glands are heated, then we go in and mechanically squeeze that melted butter out. So you can see there that, you know, it's actually quite satisfying for me to see that, um, that I know that, you know, I'm getting a lot of that clogged oil out. And I'm, I'm squeezing pretty hard. So this is not something that the patient could do on their own at home. And I realize that this looks kind of strange to you all, um, but you know, the patients, the last patient I did this on, he called the next day to leave a message. And I thought, oh no, is he like, what's going on? And he just wanted to leave a message for me saying how much better he felt. So you see that string? It's like we squeezed the butter out of like a tube of toothpaste. So this is a, um, the, this is a um, diagram to show you what happens with the lipid flow, which is a machine that simultaneously provides heat and massage to the glands. So um, the eye is on the right of your screen and the machine is on the left of your screen. And it's basically creating a sandwich where the eyelid is in between the two blades of the machine and it's heating and massaging the oil out of the glands. So here's what it looks like in real life. So the device, this is this piece right here, this gray piece right here is a brand new piece for each eye. It is disposable, so we don't reuse it between patients. Um, and you can kind of see, do you see that it's squeezing a little bit? And um, there is heat going through here. So it, it's, not, it's not so hot that um, you feel uncomfortable. It's actually most patients say that that temperature actually feels really nice. So here's a little pop quiz. Uh, I ask patients this sometimes. Before taking a bath, what is the first thing you do before turning on the faucet? So think about that for a second. If you dare to, you can put your answer in the chat. Um, but I, I literally ask this to patients sometimes. Um, because you saw that my analogy earlier of uh, the eye, like wanting to take a bath and not having enough water in the bathtub, right? And again, this is not a trick question. I'm literally asking, you go into the bathroom and you want to take a bath, not a shower, but a bath. What's the first thing you do before you turn on the water? And I've gotten all sorts of funny answers to this question, like I get naked or anyway. Uh, but the answer to the question I'll, um, has to do with this. So here you see that in a normal eye, it's like turning on the faucet and you're expecting a huge amount of water to come out. And in aqueous deficiency dry eye, so where you don't make enough of the water portion of the tears, it's like this. You've turned on the faucet all the way and you just get a little drip, drip, drip. But if you never, plug up the drain and you just let this little drip, drip, drip happen, you could be sitting there for a whole year and never have enough water to take a bath, right? So here is my son explaining this. Okay, so the answer to my question is, before you turn on the faucet, you have to put the stopper in the bathtub drain. Otherwise, the water is just going to leave the bathtub down the, down the sink, right? So this, I make this analogy because this is like what happens in the eye. So the eye makes fluid, and that fluid flows towards the nose. And there are little holes right here and here, everyone has four of them, one, two, three, four, and those holes connect to a duct and the duct drains tears away from the eye and 
goes that that goes into the nose. So this is taking tears away from the eye, just like your gutter takes the excess rainwater away from your roof. But what's going on here is if you have a dry eye, you don't want the tears to leave your eye. You don't want them to go down the nose. You want to save them. You know, the, if your eye is making just a little bit of tears, don't you want to save all those tears, right? So what we do is we plug up that hole with a plug. So there are two kinds of plugs I will show you here. Um, if you've never had a plug before, you can get a dissolvable or like a collagen plug. That's the purple thing I'm holding here. And we insert it into the small opening using a tiny forceps. So this is a dissolvable plug. You're not, you're just taking it for a test drive. At most, it's gonna last you maybe one to three months. And it's just to let you see if you liked it or you didn't like it. But if you wanna put in something more permanent, you know, if you tried the temporary one and you felt great, but the effect wore off after, you know, three months, this is a better option. So a silicone plug, do you see that little clear thing that we put in there? A silicone plug can be placed there and it can last forever. And patients, when I explain this, they're thinking it's like some huge thing. It's like sticking out of their eye. They have to go to surgery to put it in. It's as simple as what you just saw. Um, so, we do it in the office. We just numb up this area here with some drops, some uh, numbing eye drops. And it was just as simple as inserting that plug uh, the way I just showed like this. And there's nothing sticking out. There's like a little cap there that keeps it um, flush to the surface. And they can be removed too. Now, um, as the last thing I will just mention, something called amniotic membrane. Now this is certainly not for the average person with dry eye, but if you are a very, very severe um, dry eye patient, occasionally we'll use amniotic membrane to kind of give you a kickstart to your recovery. And what is amniotic membrane? So have you heard of the placenta or the afterbirth thing that comes out after the baby is born? It's been feeding a baby, growing a baby for nine months. We take the outermost membrane off of that placenta and it's treated so these cells are not alive. Um, so you don't, you can't get any communicable diseases from it. And that membrane has a lot of growth factors and healing properties. And we fashion, it's fashioned into a contact lens like device that's put on top of the cornea to uh, retain moisture and allow for healing. And especially someone who's got lots and lots of dry scratches all over the cornea, it's, the eyes are burning. You know, this is a way to quickly help those dry scratches heal. This is not something permanent, it goes in. We, we put it in in the office and we usually leave it for you know, five to seven days on average. I'll show you quickly what it looks like. So um, it comes frozen and we order it from the company. It's already fashioned into a, this contact lens like device. And it's sterile inside this packaging and it's floating in some fluid that contains antibiotics. So you'll see here that um, I'm removing it from its packaging. This thing is just a plastic cover to keep it protected. And there is the device. So there's, it's like, I like to tell patients it's like an embroidery hoop where the outside is just a plastic ring that holds its shape, but the membrane is the, the um, slippery thing in the center. So we use, um, so I won't show you the rest, but uh, so we use some, some fluid to just clean it off before we put it in the eye. And then we take it out in the office uh, about a week later, okay? So again, this is reserved for patients with very severe disease. So um, this will be the end of the, slides that we've prepared, but I just wanted to invite all of you, if any of you want to have your eyes examined so we can personally tell you what type of dry eye you have, what is the cause of your dry eye, and give you a personalized plan for your treatment of your specific dry eye condition. These are our two locations um, and our phone number. This is our Irvine location and uh, Dr. Wade and I would be happy to take any questions at this point. Um, I'm thinking um, we could start with 
Dr. Wade's um, question for Dr. Wade. So Jan it. Fisher <clears throat> asks, so this question is for you. Uh, Jan Fisher asks, does prior LASIK surgery cause dry eye? So great question. And, and by the way, great slides. All those videos are really fantastic. They help me understand what's going on and, and hopefully they're helpful to everyone. So um, yes, LASIK can cause dry eye. And the reason is when you do LASIK, you cut, you cut some of the nerves in the cornea and it takes a long time for those nerves to regrow. Now they eventually do regrow. And so that dryness does kind of, remember the curve that I showed you that showed dryness kind of just getting worse with age. Well, LASIK bumps up that dryness for, a, it can be over a year, but then eventually you just kind of meet that curve where it was going to go anyway. So LASIK, LASIK is associated with dry eye disease. And then I think the other part of that question was, is dry eye disease worse in females than males? And, you know, there is a strong association between hormones and uh, dry eye disease. So in postmenopausal women, dry eye disease does get worse. Okay, Olivia, I had a question for you. So from Lindsay, which is more effective, ointment or eye drops? Ah, good question. So um, I usually recommend patients to use eye drops during the daytime and reserve the ointments for night. The reason is because the ointment is so thick that it will blur your vision. So uh, it is definitely not recommended to use ointment while you are reading or certainly driving. Um, so, but when you're sleeping is a great time to use the ointment because one, uh, it can last hours and hours. So you don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to put anything and it doesn't matter what you see because your eyes are closed and you're sleeping. So I usually say, you know, use the drops in the daytime, use the ointment at night and the drops there are actually, you know, I call them thin ones or thick ones, but uh, the viscosity of the drop will vary from type to type. So I usually say, you know, use the thicker drops during the day when you're really suffering, but you don't need to say drive or you're not, you know, uh, using the computer, you need to like read something, um, and you can use the thinner ones that won't blur the vision when you need to drive or when you need to read, um, but just know that the thinner ones may evaporate faster, and so you might need to put them more frequently. So just to kind of add a little bit of uh, context to that as well, from my standpoint, you know, she, she mentioned thin and thick, and there's something in there, there's a thickener that that is used to help keep that ointment on your eye surface all night long. And so it's very common when you wake up that you're gonna have some pressy, some buildup of that in the morning. And that's just normal. That's not abnormal at all. That's what was helping you out during the night. So washing your face, doing those warm compresses and lid scrubs in the morning will help clean that all up. And uh, it's just one of the things that happens when you have a nice thick ointment. Okay, so uh, someone asked a question about if the eyelids don't close and ointments aren't working. Okay, so, so um, Dr. Wade showed a picture of the eyelids not closing. So again, the eyelids, they should come down and meet every time you blink and when you're sleeping. Now, everyone thinks they have their eyes closed all the time, but um, you know that's not always necessarily the case. And if your eyes are a little bit open like this when you're sleeping, you may not know yourself. So I often will ask the family member if there is someone who's accompanying them that happens to live with them. I say, you know, if you're waking up in the morning or even in the middle of the night and your eyes are really dry, it could be because you're drying out at night because your eyelids are open a little bit at night. You know, ask this, ask your family members to take a look at you when you're sleeping. So I'm, so I'm guessing that, you know, the point of your question is that you already know this is happening and you're already doing the ointment. So if you're already doing the ointment and you're still having a problem, you might want to cover the eyes when you sleep at night. So there's, um, if I could, I'm going to share my screen in a second. Um, okay, so for this is a slide that I didn't show because for time's sake, but for patients who uh, don't close the eye all the way or they're evaporating a lot of tears, either in the daytime or at night or both, 
there are, we can use moisture chamber glasses or goggles. So the glasses are for daytime, goggles are for night. And the idea is that when you wear these glasses, the air cannot pass and touch the eye. So no matter what the humidity is out in outside, so in Southern California, we have very dry air. Um, so this is very common for us. You know, if the humidity here is lower than the humidity here, then the, the tears want to evaporate. And if the eyelid isn't closing all the way, this is only going to compound the problem. So if this is truly a major problem, we sometimes recommend patients get these special glasses. But you know, this is for like relatively more severe patients. Now, the question you were asking about um, not closing the eyelids when you sleep at night, they actually do make these goggles specifically for people who have dry eye where they're um, losing tears when they sleep at night. So you can see, obviously, you can't see through these goggles. They are intended for when you sleep at night. Um, so you can buy these online. They are called Tranquil Eyes. That's the brand. Um, but you know, theoretically, even swimming goggles would work because the idea is the same, is that you're trying to trap moisture inside so that the outside air doesn't touch the eye. So I usually recommend those patients to put the thick ointment in the eye and then put these goggles on and go to sleep like that. Yeah, I'll stop. Great. So we have a question about, does eyelid surgery contribute to dry disease? So I'll take that one. So uh, it, it depends on how much eyelid surgery you have. And again, if, if we end up with a situation where the eyelid doesn't close all the way, then yes, you can have more evaporation during the day and at night, and that can cause uh, issues. However, if, if, if the surgeon's conservative, if they're paying attention to this, then, then, uh, uh, then, then it shouldn't cause too much of an issue. Typically what we see though, are patients who want to have their eyes wide open. And so they're pushing the surgeon to say, please make them more open. I want to see more of my eyes. It looks better to me. Um, but what they don't understand sometimes is that there, there are side effects to what they're asking and pushing the surgeon to do. So be aware of that. Okay, I will take a question from Carol. She says, I've been using Restasis for two years and have good results. However, the cost has increased substantially. How do plugs uh, compare? So good question. So yes, uh, these drops do cost a lot of money, unfortunately. And, you know, we're not the ones making money off of this. So, you know, you're preaching to the choir. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, the thing is that the way restasis works and the way that plugs work, they don't work the same way. So restasis is trying to reduce the inflammation that is associated with dry eye. So um, that's not the same thing as what do the plugs do. The plugs are just helping you retain more of your own tears and not having you lose them down the nose. So the plugs will not do anything for uh, an inflamed eye. So in fact, I actually avoid putting plugs when I first meet a patient, if I think that their eye is very inflamed and that the inflammation hasn't been well treated, because then it's like that picture that I showed with all the, uh, my, my kids' toys in the bathtub, right? Um, if I don't clean up those toys first and I just plug up the drain, then I'm just trapping all the dirty things in the bottom of the bathtub. So they're for different purposes, unfortunately. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that, and that harkens back to the multifactorial nature that, you know, the different components here, we have to treat them differently. And we really want a plan that's individualized for you. So I'll take the question, Lily asked, do you recommend dry eye pills? Well, remember all those great videos that show the really plugged up oil coming out like butter that oil, we can change what that looks like if we increase our omega-3 fatty acids. So yes, we often recommend that patients take pills to help uh, supplement the omega-3 fatty acids they have. It can be fish oil, or flaxseed oil. And so in that particular case, yes. There are also pills, uh, prescription pills that can help decrease the inflammation of those uh, around those oil glands. And, and they're similar to medication that are given to to younger patients with acne. So in acne, you have that inflammation around the oil gland and you get the zit and the same thing can happen with the eyelid. So we have other types of pills, medicated pills in that case, that can be helpful in decreasing inflammation of the eyelids. 
Okay, great. Um, I will um, take another question about, does dry eye cause fluctuations in vision and light sensitivity? So my answer is yes, it can. And uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. I think Dr. Wade showed you this picture, but uh, so you can see that on the right, we have a normal eye and the tears sit in front of the cornea. The cornea is a clear covering in front of your eye. So the tear film is trying to protect the cornea. And you can see on the left, a dry surface ends up being a scratched up cornea. So when we look at this microscopically, this is a picture. Uh, it's supposed to be a picture of the tear film here sitting on top of the corneal cells. So you want a nice thick layer of tears to protect the corneal cells. But when, when there's a spot of dryness, then the corneal cells are exposed. And this, we call this like a little dry scratch. Um, and we, we see that when we look at the exam. But what that why that causes decreased vision is before the light even enters your eyeball, the light first hits the tears and then enters the cornea, the lens, and gets focused on the retina. So if the tears hit a dry spot here, not a dry spot here, it just means that the quality of the light rays entering the eye is already compromised. And that can cause glare, that can cause blurry vision. So yes, that is the reason for um, dry eye, especially severe dry eye affecting the vision. And this is significant enough to us that when we do cataract surgery for patients who have a cataract here, and they need surgery to have it removed and put a new lens, we insist that the patients treat the dryness of the surface, whether they have symptoms or not, to simply improve the curvature of the cornea so that you can get a better result when you do your cataract surgery. Can you leave that up, Dr. Lee, just for a oh, second? Sure. So I, that, I, I just want to reiterate that point. It's so important. We, we both see a lot of patients who are coming in for cataract surgery, and sometimes they come in and, and it's really the dryness that's causing the symptoms of glare and blurred vision, not the cataract. Sometimes it's both, but the dryness really plays a big role. And to kind of bring a, um, a physics standpoint from an understanding to this, when the light comes in through the air and hits that tear surface, that surface is two times as powerful as the lens inside the eye. So, you know, we, during cataract surgery, we replace the lens, we give you a new lens, but that's only, you know, again, not nearly as powerful as that front surface. So when the front surface is dry and, and, and irregular, like it shows in this picture, uh, we just can't get the vision as sharp as you want it and, and the eye as comfortable as you want. So, yeah, we, we just, we spend a lot of time talking about dry eyes before, during, and after cataract surgery for this reason, because we want you to see well. And in order to see well, it's not just our part during the surgery. It's, it's a large part of it is on you to, to treat this dryness and to do the work at home to, to get that ocular surface seen better. So thanks for that picture. I think it really helps show that. Okay. Um... What else? Is there anyone who has a question who wants to speak their question? I got one here. I'm going to, I'm going to take this one while some, while people are thinking is Zydra. So Sabina asked, is Zydra the best drop around? Well, again, there, there are multiple reasons to have dry eye and there are multiple treatments that, that match up with those. Zydra and Restasis and Sequa and, and also steroids, ocular steroids, are ways to treat inflammation. So certainly Zydra is a great option. Um, in some patients, it works great. In other patients, it doesn't work as well. Um, and, and let me just even stop for that for a second. So I, I, have, I have a lot of patients come in, and Dr. Lee does as well, who have tried a couple of treatments and maybe it hasn't worked. And I just want you to imagine for a second, you're sitting in this, so maybe a bad analogy, not nearly as great as the analogies that Dr. Lee has, but if you're sitting in a pit and you're kind of in this pit and you have some boxes, you're trying to get out. So you stand on one and that's maybe one of the treatments. You stand on one and you just can't see above. And so you say, oh, that doesn't work. And, and sometimes it takes a few of these treatments stacked up together to where you're getting above the level uh, of that pit and you can and you can see out and you can, and you can get out there. So, uh, Please don't give up on treatments right away until you've maybe really worked with someone to, to 
to try combinations of treatments or, or different things because sometimes you're just too far underground uh, to see if that treatment's really gonna help. But back to your question, Zydra is a great option. It's hard to compare because there are different treatments for different conditions and for different people. Um, okay, so um, somebody asked, does Medicare cover dry eye treatments? So uh, yes and no. So, they will cover the standard treatments like the drops that we talked about, uh, all the medicated drops, the prescription drops that we discussed, the plugs, yes. Now, some of the things we talked about are not covered by insurance, like the um, procedures to express the meibomian glands and like the lipid flow um, is not covered. And the Blefex to clean the eyelashes is not covered. And someone else asked, are we still doing with the flow? Yes, we still do with the flow. Um, does it work? Um, that's a question that I would say it, it's not for everyone. So we only do it for patients who have the have my bovine gland disease, for example. I don't think it works for patients with aqueous deficiency dry eye. So I think the answer depends on who uh, it is for. Great. So Vladimir asked, does dry eye disease affect both eyes equally? And, and it's not always equal. Typically, we'll see that one eye is worse than the other. I don't always have a good explanation, although sometimes it can be associated with what side you sleep on, if that eye is getting pushed into the, into the sheets more, if that eye is closer to the window that you have rolled down on the way home from work, uh, or any other trauma or toxicity that that eye has had. But it's, uh, it's not always equal. Okay, and Nadia asked a really good question. What medical conditions cause dry eye? This is a great question because we, oh, I should find that slide. We had a slide on this and I said we have too many slides. So I, uh, I, I didn't show that slide, but there are many medical conditions that cause dry eye, okay? Um, and different types of dry eye too. So one big one is Sjogren's syndrome that we didn't really go into today, but it is an autoimmune condition that causes the eye to um, not create enough aqueous or the watery portion of the tears. But in addition to dry eye, those patients typically also have dry mouth as well. Um, but there are other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis that can cause Sjogren's syndrome. Um, so the Sjogren's syndrome can be by itself or Sjogren's syndrome can be with other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. Um, so that's something I see a lot. Um, uh, there are medications that can cause dry eye. Um, and I mean, I think what we do when we meet you for the first time is we go through your medical history, we go through your medications, um, and you know not every patient even tells us these things. Uh, you know I have seen patients for dry eye that didn't say a word to me about anything else, and I go to shake their hand back when we could shake hands, and I see that their hand, I mean I can tell by looking at their hand that their arthritis has something to do with their dry eye. Fantastic. So I'm going to answer Mina's question. How many times a day can one use the eye drop? And the answer is it depends on which eye drop we're talking about. Uh, if we're talking about artificial tears, remember when Dr. Lee uh, described the difference between those that are preservative free that come in those little vials with the twist off top or the ones that come in bottles that have preservatives. So if it's preserved, if it comes in a regular bottle, then maybe three or four times a day is probably the most you want to take that. If it's preservative free, you can take it every half an hour. You can take it as much as you want really because the preservatives over time can cause toxicity to the surface. So we wanna limit the exposure to preservatives if you're having ocular surface disease. Um, I started typing, but I might as well just say the answer to this question. So we asked, I love Lipiflo, but due to proptosis, the instrument will not stay in my eye. What would you recommend? This is a great question that I haven't actually had in person, but I have a good answer for you. So the lip of flow is that um, device that I showed makes a sandwich between the eyelid goes, the eyelid goes in between the two blades of the instrument and um, massages and heats at the same time. But let's say like Lee, her eye 
isn't the same shape as the device, and so it doesn't fit well. Um, you would be a great candidate for tear care, which is the other um, procedure that I showed where we put the stickers on the outside of the eyelid and it heats the eyelids um, with that device. And it literally is a sticker. So, you know, we can, it, it will stick to your eye no matter what shape it is. And we, it heats it for 15 minutes and then we come back with a forcep and manually, you know, we do, the doctor does, not you, we um, squeeze the glands um, individually, all four lids and see that thick oil come out. So that you would be a good candidate for that one. I'm gonna take this question from Adele. So uh, would a regular sleep mask help with closing your eyes when asleep? And, and that really depends. You know, it can, I've seen countless times where people have a sleep mask and their eyes are actually open underneath that. They can't see anything because their the mask is there, but their eyes are still drying out underneath. So if the mask is such that it helps close the eyelid, then maybe, but typically a sleep mask, you can't really, can, you can't lean on it to close the eyelids. So that's where other things can come into play, like those moisture goggles that Dr. Lee, uh, Dr. Lee mentioned. Um, someone asked a question about diabetes and dry eye. So this is a great question too. Um, so yes, dry eye is often seen in patients with diabetes and there's an interesting cause for it actually. So you, if you are a diabetic, you probably know that in severe diabetics, especially uh, patients who have had diabetes for many, many years, that they can get ulcers on their feet, um, or some in severe cases even have their toes or feet amputated, right? And why does that happen? It is because the diabetics often have neuropathy, a problem with the nerves. And so let's say you get your, you stub your toe, you're, you know, you're walking, you didn't, you didn't pay attention, you stub your toe and you got a cut on your toe, but you didn't even feel that you had a cut and days pass and you know, you're like, oh, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt. So I'm not gonna pay attention to it. Meanwhile, your toe gets infected, right? So a similar process happens in the eye. So what happens is that the patient with diabetes, because of the disease and the process of having too much sugar around, it eventually damages the nerves. The nerves then don't feel pain, even though there should be something painful going on. So in the eye, most of you on this call probably know when your eyes are really dry, they feel like burning, it's hard to keep the eyes open, you just feel really uncomfortable. But imagine that you had dry eye, but for another reason, you just didn't feel anything. So that's what can happen in diabetics is that they can have really dry eye, but they don't have any sensation of pain or burning or anything because the nerves aren't working. And that can happen, not just in diabetics, but you asked that question. So Dr. Lee, I'm going to give you this question as well. Does colitis and asthma cause dry eyes? Um, I would say not specifically those things cause it, but they could be associated. So, um, you know, for example, asthma can be one of the multiple things that go with other kinds of atopic disease, and that causes a very specific form of, I'd say, ocular surface disease, very particular type that um, is typically th thought of as being uh, inflammatory in nature. Um, and you know, colitis can be another autoimmune disease. And like I was mentioning earlier, um, patients who have autoimmune disease, dry eye can be one of the, um, the multiple symptoms that they have that affect all different kinds of organs. So we didn't get into it too much um, today because today we wanted to talk mostly about treatment, but um, in terms of diagnosis or evaluation, we have a lot of different tools that we can use to determine, is this a person who has dry eye that's associated with inflammation or not? And if it is, how inflamed is the eye? Um, so these are things that I like, I particularly like to measure when I see a patient. And uh, if the eye is associated with inflammation, I like to treat that. And we talked about some of the drops that we use. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into the conversation of like, what is better, stasis or Zydra? I, I mean, I don't own stock in any of them. 
I'm not consulted for either of those companies. I think both medications work. And, you know, honestly, some people need both. Some people need more than both of those things. And uh, again, it's like very much tailored to each patient's specific situation. Well, gosh, thank you everyone for being here. I just, you know, as you can see, all these great explanations that Dr. Lee has given and the great analogies. I just want to point out that I love working where I work. I work with so many great people like Dr. Lee and whatever eye conditions you have, we have a specialist in that field. And I'd recommend you, uh, you reach out and, and meet them. I think you'll be impressed just like I've been uh, with their uh, abilities and their humanity, their, their interest in you as a person and in your condition. So thank you again for being here tonight. Yes, thank, thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, it was really a pleasure. We wish we could do this in person at some point in the future. Thank you, Dr. Wade and Dr. Lee. It was a great presentation. And we hope the rest of you will join us for the next one coming up on uh, April 5th. It'll be on age-related macular degeneration. Thank you.